So I suspect uh, the panelists uh, most of you are likely familiar with. Uh, Stephen Downs is with the National Research Council. And uh, he's probably, as he notes in his, his bio, uh, best known for the work that he's done with uh, OL Daily. And it's something that's uh, really probably as close as you get to a definitive source of ed tech news in the field. So he's been doing that for uh, for well over a decade now, and certainly is prominent as well in the speaker circuit too. I've had the pleasure of uh, well, pleasure. I'll use that word loosely for both of our benefits, but I've had the pleasure of running numerous uh, open online courses with Stephen. There now referred to as MOOCs, and uh, the attention seems to be shifting from some of our early pioneering work into those organizations uh, such as Udacity and others that are doing this on a different scale or with uh, you know different intent than what we had. But nonetheless, uh, so that's uh, Stephen and we've interacted with over a fair bit over the last several years, and he's certainly a strong advocate for openness in education. Um, now I'm just quickly continuing. We're going to go with Mark here. Uh, so Mark McCutcheon is an assistant prof in uh, literary studies at Athabasca University. Uh, you'll also see links to uh, his uh, Twitter profile as well as his blog. Uh, he's very active. We have a social service here at Athabasca called The Landing, and it's something that uh, John John will likely talk about a little bit more during our session later on today. And uh, he's uh, certainly a significant uh, contributor to the development of the social media culture within Athabasca University. So it's a pl uh, pleasure to have him involved. And uh, Tony Bates, again, uh, I suspect many of you are familiar with him already. Uh, he is, as I think Stephen referred to him once, uh, he's forgotten more about the ed tech field than most of us will ever know in our lifetime. And uh, that certainly is the case if you follow him on his blog or have interacted with him in the past. Extremely well informed on what's happening in uh, e-learning, distance education, and the ed tech space in general. So with that, as our three panelists, we're going to start with, uh, with Stephen as the, uh, the opening reactor, and then we'll have Mark, and then we'll have Tony respond, and then from there we'll move into a more conversation type of format. I've put up a blank whiteboard here, so for those of you who like to doodle and draw while you're uh, sitting at your computer, feel free to grab a pen and mark things up. I also encourage you to ask questions or provide, provide reactions to either the speakers or to the presentations uh, that we had earlier as well. Stephen, over to you. Well, thanks, George. And uh, my first reaction is it's actually kind of hard to react to a video. You wouldn't think so. Uh, but, but I notice myself listening differently to the video recording than I would be listening to Michael directly. So that I found a little bit disconcerting. I, I wanted him to be here because I wanted to ask him a question. The other day, somebody parked their car right at the end of my driveway. I have a photo on Flickr to prove it. Uh, too loud, do you say? Seriously? OK. Uh, that might be better. Uh, is the audio better now? Uh, OK, great. Sorry about that. I just kind of crank up the volume. Anyhow, there was this car that was parked at the end of my driveway and blocking me in. I took a couple photos of the car. And then the owner came back and I went running out and took a couple of photos of the owner uh, who had parked her car. Actually, it was a big red truck, which made it all the worse. And I had a nice conversation after uh, with the constable Willette with the RCMP about the legality of the photographs, the taking of the photographs and the use of the photographs. And he told me that it would be illegal for me to post these photographs online. And I wondered about that. And that he wasn't able to cite any specific law, which I thought was a little odd, but there you go. And just put it with policemen aren't lawyers. So OK. And I was going to ask Michael Geist, if, uh, if I am in fact go out. But it, it points to, I think, something that I wish he had addressed a bit more in this talk. Because it, it, it kind of went through, it was the standard, here's the legislation, here's what it says, here's the opposition to it. And you were, we, we ran through that theme about 10 times. And we went from the blackout protests, and of course we had the discussion in the chat room about the blackouts of earlier years, and uh, the one that, that took place, I remember I took 
place in that one uh, back in '96, and then the uh, Blue Ribbon campaign, all protests and communication decency act, which everybody knew was an internet censorship act, sponsored by the publishers. In fact, Time magazine came out with these scandalous articles about it. And uh, mushroom cloud or tree. Uh, I'm going to go with mushroom cloud. <laughs> um, what, what I wanted to see from Mike was a, a bit of a, a look at the balance between the, the different kinds of rights and privileges that different organizations have. Because, you know, security for companies and, and corporate data is one thing, but it's balanced by security for personal data and, and personal computers. Uh, the right of corporations to write about such and such a topic is balanced on the other side by the right of people to write about such and such a topic. And just today, and, and Michael carried it in his own blog, was a thing about some regulations being postulated by the CRTC, and, and here they are, they're in the chat room, um, showing, and, and I see that Blackboard Collaborate has put little icons in front of each one of them. That I had nothing to do with the little icons. That's entirely Blackboard's doing. Although I think it's very interesting. I guess, yeah, okay. I guess, the, I guess, keystrokes correspond to that. Okay. Oh, isn't that wild? That is amazing. Okay. So anyhow, and basically, what these regulations covered were uh, things that software had to get a user's permission in order to do. So, you know, collecting personal information, you have to get permission. Uh, changing or interfering with settings. It's like LinkedIn, changing my digest from daily to weekly. I don't want LinkedIn to do it, but it just does it without even asking. Uh, changing or interfering with data, et cetera, et cetera. And the intent, of course, was to uh, to stop things like spyware, uh, but they also it also interferes with uh, things like digital rights management, Sony's rootkit, etc. If we had a set of rights that protected personal interests as well as protecting corporate interests, then the the legislation being proposed to protect corporate interests would not be so odious. As it stands, though, there is no balance. And as it stands, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like fighting in the courts. Even if you do have the same rights, if it's you versus a large corporation, it's going to be an uneven battle. And it, it almost doesn't matter what the legislation says. And you get that feeling, you know, looking at uh, some of the things that Michael talked about the uh, the letter writing campaigns against the various sorts of legislation. The overwhelming weight of the legislation on one side of the issue, and the government turning around and doing the other side of the issue. So I think there are some deeper issues running here, and I, there, these are issues that are deeper than just uh, you know. Can we copy stuff produced by a publisher? What is fair use? And can they force us to take down stuff we put on our website? I think the deeper issues have to do with what are the rights of individuals in today's society when held up against the rights of corporations uh, and, and, and the large and the powerful, and then for that matter, governments. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes think of the analogy with globalization and free trade, under which a lot of these agreements are being toast. So we have global movement of capital, we have global movement of corporations, global movement of products, but the people are still restricted. The people do not have freedom of movement around the globe. You're stuck in the country where you were born. Uh, you know, and, until we redress this imbalance, we're going to continue to have issues like this, and I fear the issues will not be resolved in the favor of a democratic process. And that's my view and reaction. Thanks, Stephen. I will throw the mic over to Mark now. 
Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me to participate here. I, um, in listening to Michael Geist's talk, uh, yeah, I was also um, curious to have him in the room, as it were, to be able to ask him some on the spot questions. But I do have a number of responses uh, that I'd like to share to his talk. Um, I'm going to paste the main points into the chat window. So the first one um, is a point that has also been made, not just in Geist's talk, but has also been made um, by the Swedish Pirate Party founder, uh, Rick Falkvist. Mark, I'm not sure if you accidentally Sorry. hit uh, the button or something, but you disappeared for a bit. Yeah, George, thanks. I was just pasting some text into the chat window. Uh, it seems like I have to hold this talk button down to stay on here. If you have another way for me to do that, I'm all ears. But um, the point that uh, Falkinge makes, as does Michael Geist, is that what uh, the particularly recent rounds of digital advocacy have done is to very effectively expose uh, the various attempts to change copyright law for what they are, which are a kind of concerted attack on civil liberties. Okay, so, and as guys indicates, these are not attacks, or these are not um, legislative initiatives and trade agreement initiatives that are going to let up anytime soon. So ACTA is now on the rocks. Um, the U.S. is moving on to other potential targets with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right? Uh, this is called forum shopping, and they will they will do it constantly until they get the laws that uh, serve their interests. So it's not a fight that is anywhere near from over as effective as it has yet been. Okay. Yeah, I see how to toggle it. Thanks, George. Um, the next point I want to make is that. Um, what I, and this is a sort of more hopeful point, I, I think, is that um, I like to see the internet uh, advocacy and protests going on now as um, a symptom, to some extent, of the shifting mediascape of popular culture. That is, as some uh, op-eds had suggested in the wake of the SOPA protest. Um, we are looking at a shift in what actually constitutes popular culture, which has traditionally been ruled by broadcast structured content and, and media. Uh, the Internet it has the potential to be changing that, has been busy changing that really since uh, its inception, but very recently has become so dramatically more ubiquitous in people's everyday lives that um, it's almost as though people watch TV and go to movies to have something to tweet about or Facebook about rather than um, organizing their leisure activities around um, the more broadcast type entertainment media as the mainstay of popular culture. I wonder if we're seeing a shift in what actually constitutes popular culture. Uh, that's sort of a, an open standing question there. Um, and related to that, as, as uh, perhaps an attempt to further shift the, the mediascape of popular culture towards the Internet away from what has been characterized perhaps in oversimplistic terms as big content, the entertainment lobbies um, that speak for Hollywood and the music labels, for instance. Uh, this month, um, the hacker group Anonymous has been running what they call Black March, which is a protest kind of a boycott. They've kind of glammed up what's basically a boycott, advising people to boycott any and all entertainment products from uh, big content, such as uh, Hollywood and music. They're, they've been advising people not to buy music, not to go to movies. And uh, a boycott is always a kind of um, a, a risky strategy and, and has certain assumptions that are, are problematic in terms of uh, being grounded in um, consumerism and, and its ideologies and premises. But I think it's an interesting kind of move to suggest that one of the most effective ways to fight back against the persistence of these initiatives to change uh, copyright law and Internet law is to try to hit the companies behind these laws where they hurt, uh, that is, uh, in, their, in their profit margins. Um, so the idea here was to uh, to try to make a visible dent in big content's profit margins for the first quarter of this year as a way to say, you know, quit it, 
with the draconian laws already. Uh, the success of that campaign remains to be seen, and I'd, I'd be curious to see if there's any reporting or analysis uh, once the month is officially over in a couple of days. Um, more immediately, the last point I want to make here is that uh, the um, digital advocacy that we're seeing is in some ways a symptom of uh, a fragmenting Internet as the laws governing the Internet become more draconian and as efforts to change laws become more persistent, um, the Internet itself could uh, be substantially reshaped, um, fragmented really, in terms of um, moving away from a kind of centralized web experience towards something if anything, more like what the Internet used to be before the web, which was a series of, of, of different um, lower profile networks, um, such as uh, Gopher, for instance, um, or, or other uh, early tools like that. So I, I wonder if these laws are um, producing a proliferation of internets, of, of different um, networks as a kind of uh, formation that's far more distributed and not necessarily as integrated as, as what the World Wide Web currently offers today. Um, I mean, this is the this is the nature of what overregulation does. Overregulation of any particular sector uh, will reliably drive its object further underground. And sometimes I wonder if that really is the uh, object of, of laws and initiatives like this to actually uh, introduce legislation and trade agreements that are actively criminalizing larger portions of the population to um, satisfy other industrial sectors such as the prison industrial complex. That might be veering a little too far into other areas in which I'm really not as expert. So I think I'll, I'll leave my uh, response there in terms of um, the usefulness of digital advocacy in exposing copyright law as an attack on civil liberties, in terms of understanding the Internet protests as a symptom of the shifting mediascape of popular culture, and perhaps as also a symptom of a very different looking, differently shaped Internet uh, in the future. Anyway, thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Tony, over to you. Oh, thank you, George. Um, I, you know, Michael's presentation made me think of the old expression, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And I'm really grateful that we have people around like Michael who's able to both understand the law and actually follow what's happening and give warnings to us all about what's happening. Uh, I, I find it pretty scary, actually. I find a lot of things about the Internet increasingly scary, um, or things around the Internet incre increasingly scary. I'm particularly concerned about individual privacy um, uh, and, and the way that's being commercialized in, in particular. So. Um, I totally agree with uh, Stephen, and, and that's not always true, is it, Stephen? But I do agree with you this time that the balance of the law is very much, surprise, surprise, overloaded towards large corporations and not focused enough on the, the rights of individuals. Um, and the other thing that worries me here is, is the question of what to do as an individual. Um, what do I do? Um, to protest these um, these developments. First of all, often I'm unaware of these developments. I have no idea, for instance, what Facebook is doing with, uh, if I was on Facebook, which I've come off now, but if I was on Facebook, I would have no idea what they're doing with my private data. I have no idea what Google is doing with my private data, and I can't come off Google for obvious reasons. So. So, you know, it's the right to know as much as the right to do. Um, if I know, then I can act. But if I don't know, I can't act. And the second thing is the complexity of copyright law. Um, it, it, it basically, we're trying to have one law that, trying to, that, that has to deal with a vast range of different problems. And I don't think that's good law. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but, uh, you know, blanket laws never work very well. So 
what we've got are, is a copyright law that is focused on the entertainment industry particularly um, and obviously there need to be some protections for companies that are investing $200 million in a movie that then fails. Um, but on the other hand, do we need that same law to cope with educators trying to use media for, for teaching or for individuals trying to um, express a, a personal opinion and quoting other people, for instance? And I, I don't think we need one blanket law, but a number of different laws that would deal or different uh, bills or rights or articles of laws that would deal with different things. I, in Canada, we have uh, both provincial and federal privacy commissioners, and I was wanted to ask Michael um, if he'd been around. Uh, what do you think their role is too narrowly prescribed at the moment? It's it's focused primarily on individual privacy and data, but it seems to me that there are some issues here around copyright as well, where somebody needs to speak for the individual rather than for the corporation. And I'm wondering if the Privacy Commissioner's role shouldn't be uh, extended somewhat to uh, deal with some of the issues that Michael is, is raising. And lastly, you know, it, it would be nice if we could get rid of the copyright law altogether. I, I mean, it would be nice if we could have free data and free media. And, and to be honest, I think the publishing industry in particular is using the law to try to protect an industry that is no longer um, that is no longer valid. It doesn't have a valid business model now because of the internet. And so it's trying to use the law to protect its position. And, uh, and that is very, very disconcerting. I think the same is true of the movie and, mu and music industries as well. So. Um, so I, I agree with Stephen that we, we need to have and continue to press for uh, more individual rights, but my worry is how to do that and uh, how as individuals we can do that. So I'll stop at that point. All right, well, thanks to each of you for the uh, overview of your opening statements. And so we certainly have, and certainly copyright and IP and law in general is certainly not going to be uh, you know, fully addressed in, a, in the short time that we have here. But perhaps if we could shift the, the direction a little bit, we've had uh, arguments made around the issues of uh, copyright law, uh, civil liberties being attacked, uh, the need for, as Stephen iterated and Tony uh, supported, which is that the conversation around copyright and law is quite one-sided one way. It favors the institutions, often the content creators, and it essentially attacks the, the end users to varying degrees. So if we take the discussion we've had so far and we bring it into an educational context, what worries you most around the trajectory of copyright law or international IP? What worries you most about that from an educational context? So wide open question, anyone can jump in. Can you restate the question, please, George? I didn't quite follow it. Sure. No, I was just saying, if you look at you know, the conversation that we've had around uh, where copyright's trending and what the uh, content owners are doing in terms of asserting their rights to assert control over the end user, things such as the three strikes policy or being able to essentially eliminate uh, the rule of law in terms of how we are treated by corporations with our use of content. If you take that discussion, and you shift it to the educational space, what are you most concerned about in terms of what, what, do, you, what do you fear will happen in the education space if we continue this trajectory? I think it really depends on what you mean by the education space. I mean, typically we think about educational institutions, but as we uh, discussed in the chat, just at the very beginning of the uh, conversation, it's not clear what side educational institutions are on here. And, and certainly there are major producers of content and uh, as institutions, uh, major producers of, of IP and, and patents, not so much trademarks, I guess. And so more and more may, may stand with the proponents of copyright clampdowns. Uh, and against uh, what I would call individual liberties. So I think 
the, if, if I have to be asked what, what is the major fear that I have, uh, it's essentially the, the uh, eventual and oncoming ownership of education with a capital E uh, by these interests. Uh, I'm not sure where to take that from here, but that's what I'll put on the table for now. Uh, George, yeah, I, I think the, the universities are, are in a bit of a mess at the moment. They're, they're split on, on the copyright law, um, and I think that's a big shame. Not surprising. I'm not surprised by it, but uh, it, there are some real restrictions uh, in that new law still uh, on what uh, academics can do and what they can't do in terms of uh, and what students can download and, and reuse. Um, I know UBC has one person full time uh, being a, a, a digital policeman now going around all the courses making sure the university and the professor isn't breaking the law which is really concerning when you have to have somebody doing that and because the law is so complex most, most faculty just don't understand what, what it means. And, and again, that's that's the problem with a blanket one uh, law trying to cover everything makes it extremely difficult for people to know how to interpret the law and what to do because nobody's going to sit down um, and nobody's a lawyer and wants to go through every uh, clause in a bill to make sure that they're 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 within compliance. So and and the, and the problem is that we're all at risk now. We're all at risk of breaking that law because we don't really understand what's in it because it's so complex. And so I, I think it's a real inhibitor to the freedom of information and freedom of uh, expression. I'd just like to uh, respond to that by uh, noting as somebody who has actually sat down and uh, read through the bill as part of uh, I did a weekend course on the upcoming bill. And it was a very interesting experience because there are actually a few different ways uh, to read law when you get down to needing to interpret it. I, I should say I'm neither a lawyer nor a legal scholar. Um, but it's, it's always a very interesting experience to sit down and read through the text of the law. And, and something that emerged in our close reading of Bill C-11 is that um, while Geist has uh, very legitimately voiced concern that the digital locks provisions will trump every other potential gain in the upcoming copyright law. Another way to read the law in re uh, with reference not just to the text of the law itself but also with reference to uh, the court record and the record of recent decisions made um, in terms of copyright and education. There's, there's an alternate reading that suggests that at least in the educational context, fair dealing could trump the proposed uh, digital locks provisions. So one particular thing I think we need to do as educators, uh, first of all, is to uh, better uh, acquaint ourselves with, um, uh, with the particular laws in, in question. It, it can be really boring reading. Nobody is going to <laughs> tell you otherwise. But um, also to, uh, to understand the particular uh, provision that is fair dealing, uh, which in the educational context has um, a history of enjoying fairly robust decisions made by the Supreme Court on behalf of, uh, or finding rather in favor of educational institutions rather than uh, the private firms. So uh, fair dealing is, is one particular part of the law that Geist has said stands to be expanded uh, in the new law. And I think it's something that as educators we owe it to ourselves to look more closely at because um, it's not the kind of provision we just get to keep if we never exercise it. We need to um, be a little uh, aggressive, if anything, in how we understand and how we implement fair dealing and being able to copy one-off texts for classroom use or enable or, or in, uh, deciding that we want to show a video that maybe hasn't been institutionally cleared. You know, there, these are sort of ways to uh, work um, within fair dealing provisions which uh, we do stand to gain a fair bit from uh, under the new law. So uh, there, there, are, there are a couple of ways to, to read this, this particular problem of digital locks in the context of fair dealing which uh, in being clarified and in being brought closer to uh, U.S. fair use could be a, a real game that we owe ourselves to find out about so that we can exploit it really to the full. 
Okay, thank you. And, and for others here, I just want to mention, if you'd like to take the mic, just above our names, there's a little hand. You just click that hand and that'll let me know that you'd want to grab the mic and ask a question for our panelists or just in general to the audience. That's uh, encourage you to do that, as, uh, do that as well. Now, one of the points that Stephen's touched on twice now, and I'd love to hear particularly from Tony and Mark and, and clarification from Stephen is fine as well, but it's this notion that the universities are uh, really not clear on which side they're on. Uh, are they on the side of the, the students, the educators, educators, the end users of content, or are they increasingly moving to side with the copyright owners? So anybody want to tackle that one? Where are universities positioned now in this copyright or intellectual property discussion? And perhaps, where should they be positioned? Uh, so we'll uh, throw that out open. Terry, if there's an open mic, feel free to take it whenever you'd like. Well, uh, George, uh, I'd, I'd like to respond to that. Is that the problem when you say universities, as Stephen says, when we're talking about learning, obviously the, the institutions don't don't have a, a lock on learning. But when you're talking about education, uh, it by and large is uh, institutionally orientated. And so, uh, as Tony noted, you know the, the universities are not clear on on that whole question. The faculty have have some ideas, and that some of that's a little. Uh, Based upon the proprietary or the pecuniary interest of, uh, of them as authors and uh, in, uh, IP owners, uh, but uh, they, they seems like faculty by and large only care or will only get upset about academic freedom and about money issues, whereas uh, administrators um, seems like uh, they are have been almost completely silent uh, when they have a lot to gain by by opening up access. So it makes um, unless they're you know, under the consideration of, of, of uh, corporate partnership kind of thinking, but they really shouldn't be. But, but I wonder if anybody could could respond from the from the college or even the K twelve sector because it, they don't have this long tradition of uh, the faculty being IP owners, and yet they seem to be more or less silent on the uh, on on this whole uh, their rights uh, and uh, their their use of fair right and the, and the digital locks, or or have I just missed their input? Mike, is yours, Tony? Tony, I think Tony Ratcliffe's got his hand up. Uh, at this point, the only one I see with the hand up is uh, is yours, Tony. So feel free to take it away. Okay, uh, I just wanted to respond to Mark's point about um, about fair dealing, and the problem is that fair dealing really requires definition by case law now. Um, you, you know, it's not clear enough. Uh, you'll have to go to uh, court. And um, going back to Terry's point, why administrators have been quiet about this, what they don't want is to be the first one in front of a judge, because that's going to cost the institution a huge amount of money. So uh, I, I think you know the fair dealing law needs to be tested, um, particularly in Canada. Um, but no university wants to be the first one up there, um, and I, I think that's what inhibits uh, administrators, and that's why they're putting the digital police into place. Um, well, uh, the universities have already uh, come up in, in the court cases I um, alluded to, so the precedent case is uh, Law Society, um, um, sorry, it was a 2004 case, um, Law Society of Upper Canada um, versus a, a copyright collective that alleged that the Law Society library was making unauthorized copies. Um, but the Law Society's successful uh, defense uh, against that allegation and the consequent ruling for fair dealing, I mean, means that universities have really already been up against this, and there have been uh, precedents established in, in Supreme Court law. Well, so it seems like we're, we're asserting that somebody uh, needs to be responsible for pushing back. I think one of the biggest benefits that the content owners have in this regard is that they are organized, they have fairly deep pockets, and they're taking not just a you know, local kind of view on this, but they're connected globally, which means that uh, one of the biggest exporters of uh, copyright 
law, if you will, is coming from, uh, let's say, countries like U.S. or uh, areas like Europe or, or even countries like Canada, because they're forming these conglomerates, if you will, and they're pushing a fairly similar agenda around the world. So the difficulty, I think, that universities have exactly what Tony touched on is who's going to be the first to stand in line. And this is a game that, I mean, it really comes from patent trolls. Uh, so if you have a patent that someone uh, says they own, uh, as long as everyone stands up to it and is willing to fight, often the patent troll ends up failing. But if you have even a few small systems, that companies that start to say, okay, fine, I'll license that so-called patent from you, and then over time, they start to own it, and then, uh, you know, as Microsoft is doing with Android, they're making more money off Android than Google is because of their patent enforcement. So, I guess th that's the challenge that, that I'd put out to the panel is, uh, how do these individuals become organized, the universities or educators or otherwise, to present an equally coherent voice to push back so that, because in, individually these systems will fall and sign on or, or do what Tony mentioned, have a full-time IP or copyright person basically serving the needs of corporate entities like Terry touched on as well, but they're being paid for by public funds. What does it look like? What kind of a model do we have that allows an ability to uh, respond back to these uh, IP interests? Uh, well, just one very modest and practical thing that I know a number of institutions uh, are doing and Athabasca is doing is developing a fair dealing policy that is a public policy document that uh, anybody at the university can refer to in terms of understanding how to uh, implement and flex fair dealing for their own purposes. Um, it's a way to indicate that it's uh, a known quantity, it's a known um, privilege that the university is within its rights to, uh, to exercise and to promote to its members. So that's one thing uh, that we can do at the very practical policy level. So if I, as an individual, appeal to and use Athabasca's policy and then lose my case in court, do I have any uh, recourse to Athabasca? Probably not. Uh, it's one thing to have a policy, but you know, I mean, it's quite another to have one that you know if you follow, you'll be fine. Uh, yeah, Stephen, that's a very good point. Um, the court records show there's really no um, there's there's no record of a collecting agency such as, for instance, Access Copyright for having ever gone after a particular individual. And the reason for that is simply money. And a particular individual exercising uh, their fair dealing rights doesn't have the pockets deep enough for a collecting agency or a content rights holder to care about. So. Uh, you'd think on that account they would go after institutions, but because the institutions are one of the main clients, or have been until recently, one of the main clients of a collecting intermediary like Access Copyright, um, neither does, uh, neither does the, the court uh, records show that Access Copyright in itself has, has gone after any institution. Um, so it, it is an interesting area, and it's a problematic area. Uh, and it, it is uh, admittedly a, a risky area, but the, the um, the history of cases here does suggest that uh, we have, uh, you know, we have the, the law uh, as a pretty strong defense. Yeah, just to set the record straight, and George put it in the comments, uh, there are cases of copyright collectors going after individuals. There were tons of individuals sued, and sometimes for very large amounts of money. Uh, you know, by the RIA, RIAA over uh, what was alleged to be copyright infringement uh, by the sharing of music. Uh, and there's a, a case, and again, I mentioned it uh, in the uh, chat area earlier on. I'm not sure if I still have the link here or not. I, I don't think I do. Uh, about the uh, individual who lives in Britain who shared some links to some file sharing sites, link. He wasn't actually sharing files. Uh, a practice that's perfectly legal under British law, and yet nonetheless was extradited and charged uh, under U.S. law for breaking copyright. So the risks to individuals are indeed significant, and uh, 
you know, the, the, the lobby or the cartel has no hesitation to slap down any, any individual. There's also the case of, I think it's Jeff Tenenbaum, or it might be Mark Tenenbaum, I forget which, um, who uh, was taken to court and convicted for uh, downloading a large number of JSTOR articles. And that's interesting because these articles were freely available. And he was exercising a right that he had under the terms of end user uh, terms of use, but they still took them to court. So, what are you going to do? Tony, I see your mic is open. Did you want to uh, respond to that? Uh, Actually, I, it was was an accident, but <laughs> I, I, I will comment, not, not so much on, on that, but one of the things that I wanted to go back to that Michael raised earlier on was how do we as individuals um, try to influence these laws? And um, I find that very difficult, I must admit, um, particularly over SOPA. I, did actually make an effort to try to understand what SOPA was about, um, and I, I didn't know what to do. Should I have blacked out my website for the day like uh, Stephen did? Um, um, probably I should have done, but I wasn't sure it would have made much difference. I, I have a feeling of impotence here. You know, I just really feel that um, it's really hard for individuals. Um, even working together to take on these very, very large corporations who seem to have uh, tremendous power now to influence the law in their favor. And uh, maybe I'm just alone on this, and maybe I should be doing more as a citizen to participate, but I do feel pretty powerless here, and I wonder if other people have that feeling as well. I'll green check mark if you feel powerless in this uh, in this space, and uh, uh, you know uh, X if you if you don't. So it's just a top above our names. You can sort of drop in your response. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could if you talk, talk to Stephen or uh, Mark, Mark or others. Why do you feel powerless? Like, what is it that makes you feel powerless in this discussion? Just to update an earlier remark of mine, it was Aaron Schwartz, not Tenenbaum. Tenenbaum was charged with something else. We'd have to look that up separately. Aaron Schwartz with the uh, JSTOR articles, and I tossed a reference into there. And I see George has done one as well. Uh, what makes us feel powerless, George, is the fact that we are powerless. Uh, and increasingly so, as the as the uh, inequity between rich and poor grows, uh, you know, and I'm actually one of the you know speaking personally, I'm one of the more empowered in society. I actually have a decent job, at least for today. We'll see what tomorrow looks like. I have a good education, capacity to express myself, and yet uh, I'm pretty much unable to influence public policy uh, despite those advantages. And I remember when I didn't have any of those things and I wasn't even allowed in public buildings, much less unable to influence public policy. And that's the reality for most people in the world. And my own approach over the years has been to increasingly say that our answers are not going to be found in the institutions as they exist. These institutions will preserve and protect the existing order, and I don't think you can make change from within. And I haven't seen a successful example of this. And when you're within the institution, you're, you're in a very vulnerable position. Believe me, I know I'm in one. And the change that I make in the world isn't within this institution, but my own placement within the institution actually makes me more vulnerable. So, you know, people ask me, where do you think the change in schools is going to happen? I say outside the schools. 
where will the change in government happen, I have to say, outside the government. And I think the only answer to any of these things is going to be, in the long run, to set up alternative and parallel systems, alternative and parallel systems of commerce, alternative and parallel systems of education, alternative and parallel systems of government. And, you know, either, either in that is, you know, not a guaranteed path to success because the existing system can and will do everything it can to maintain its monopoly. But I think it's the only hope. Uh, I, I think that if we want something new in education, we have to invent it for ourselves and set it up for ourselves and set it up outside the existing system where, and, and with the hope that if it has an underlying value, that this value will slowly, ever so slowly permeate the existing system and turn the flow of co-option the other way, if you will. Um, and, and beyond that, uh, I, I actually I see little hope, and I don't want to go off into a, a Dave Pollard funk and say, well, it's the end of civilization. Um, but I do want to say that unless we get this right, uh, you know, unless we're able to change this imbalance of power, that it's not going to go well for many, many people. And, uh, you know, there will be long-term and serious social consequences ranging from failure to deal with the environment to increasing uh, anger on the part of people who have been dispossessed to all the social problems that will follow from those two things. All right, well, um, I guess uh, Mark or Tony don't want to tackle that one in terms of the feeling of powerlessness or not, and uh, the point of, uh, that Stephen raised about uh, the way to change the institution is actually not to uh, work within the institution, it's to work from outside building parallel systems. Uh, certainly an interesting perspective and one that uh, I would imagine could well take a long period of time, but it uh, would be interesting to tackle that one a little bit deeper. Mark, over to you. Oh, it just uh, it occurs to me um, in uh, reflecting on Stephen's comments uh, that something that occurs to me from time to time is that technology is showing itself for better or worse to keep itself at least one step ahead of the law. So uh, that is clearly one of several systems in play in um, how uh, the powerless can, you know, um, seize. Uh, some of, of the power in limited ways. So this uh, internet fighting back phenomenon is one example of that. Uh, and of course there are um, better and, and worse examples of technology um, prompting changes in the law or subverting the law or whatnot. Uh, but um, you know, if, if uh, as I said earlier, we need to pay much closer attention to the laws themselves, then uh, what I think um, a venue like this uh, that we're sharing today it su suggests is that um, a, a similar uh, vigilant attention to technology, its affordances, its its limits, uh, and certainly the <laughs> terms of service that govern it, as somebody mentioned in the chat thread a little while ago. Also, um, all of these things require not just our, our vigilant attention, but our, our creative adaptation and appropriation in order to uh, make them you know work for the 99%, not the 1%. Um, I noticed that uh, S. Law has asked a really good question about uh, student works that infringe copyright. Um, and again, that's an interesting point. Uh, and uh, one of the things I've been looking at recently is uh, what's happening inside learning management systems and what's happening outside them. And uh, one of the very uh, r good things about a learning management system is that it stays private. Um, so if students do, do copy illegally and post it within 
within the privacy of the learning management system, it may still be legal, but it's less likely to lead to um, prosecution and so on of either the student or the institution. So, so it's one of the few arguments I can see in favour of privacy within online teaching is that it does uh, allow a much uh, freer way of um, of communicating and one of the things I heard frequently from faculty particularly in business was um, the comment that um, you know one things one thing we need is to have that freedom of expression we can actually criticize uh, companies online within the learning management system if we go outside that in blogs and so on we're liable to uh, prosecution and so on so um, I, I'm, that's quite in, an interesting spin on on learning management systems that I hadn't seen before um, it gives more freedom to work within that closed space um, which is not open to the public um, so I, again I, I'd be interested in what other people feel about that but I think there is protection for students within the learning management system if nothing else Uh, I'd like to respond, Tony, briefly to that. It's just that uh, I think you're quite right, and that's the you know one of the values of of having a special and that has been a traditional function of uh, universities uh, is a you know a refuge for scholarship. But at the same time, uh, the problem with the LMS is that the student cannot decide to open up to the world, and uh, and I think that there is no one right privacy setting. What's uh, freedom of speech for one person is an infringement on privacy or a copy right infraction for another. So I think the, the only really good systems are those that allow uh, individuals to decide uh, how open or how close, not the system that the institution uh, particularly uses. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting because I think there will be some cases soon because I've noticed that uh, Marxist faculty aren't ready to uh, open up their classrooms. but. Uh, for instance, UBC has a very interesting site now called UBC Wiki. Uh, nearly, well, a very large number of the online courses have this publicly open space, um, which is presumably password. To, to, to get into the space, you have to have a password. But anybody can read this, and, it, it, and, and you can apply for a password, even if you're not a student, to participate in that discussion. And uh, I think eventually we will see some court cases coming out over people being criticized in open blogs and open wikis from universities and it will be very interesting to see how that plays out in a court of law. You know, you've got the free speech versus um, pers people's right, personal rights not to be libeled and so on. Uh, and I, I think it is an interesting issue. I, I do see it coming up and I'm not sure if the, um, the law is in a position yet where the balance is going to be right in these cases. All right, well, we're, uh, we've got about four minutes left. So what I'd like to do in the, the last four minutes is just give each of you an opportunity, to our panelists, to provide sort of a quick summary, a few concluding thoughts, and uh, then we wrap up as we turn it over to the next session uh, that I believe uh, is going to take uh, an opportunity to go into a little bit more detail uh, around this topic. We're going to look at the learning technology exploration. Sorry, I'm not sure who just dove in there. I'm, I cut them off as they were speaking. Um, anyway, so we, we're going to uh, look a little bit at uh, Athabasca University Open Press, publishing open access journals, and uh, then the 1230 to 1 session will be John Drawn looking at open learning through social media, which will have relevance to the topic that we just raised toward the end here. But uh, let's give each of our presenters here uh, about a minute or so to do some concluding thoughts. Uh, yeah, I think I came over unduly negative when I said I felt powerless. <laughs> but uh, I feel powerless in terms of influencing public legislation. That's that's where I feel powerless. Um, I feel uh, empowered in terms of what the internet allows me to do at the moment. And what I fear is having that power taken away from me. And so I think it's made me more determined this session to be more active in protecting my freedoms and uh, I hope freedoms of everybody else on the internet. So that's what I'd like to say as a way of ending. Yeah, I, I want to follow up and say pretty much the same thing. 
uh, you know, without the internet, I don't get this job. I don't get to talk with all of you. I don't really get much more than uh, uh, a career in the uh, hospitality industry, which is a fine career, and I was very happy when I worked in restaurants. But this is better. Um, and and my fear is is losing this, um, not this job or this career particularly, but losing the, the capacity that I have now. To, to express myself, to make my opinions known, uh, to change, if not public policy, that would be forever beyond my reach. But uh, you know, to tra change minds and reach people, and uh, you know, I think of myself today not so much as speaking to society of today as speaking to the future, in, in the hope that the, the capacity that allowed me to express my views today may ultimately in the long term allow society to change in a wider way tomorrow. These things take time and we all understand that. Uh, and, and my concern is that society will go the other way. And that uh, these words and the words of my contemporaries and, uh, and, and those in the Occupy movement and those of the Arab Spring and all the rest of it will be silenced and, and, and that will move to a society which is dull and gray and ordered and structured. And, and that would be a sad thing, I think. So what's my final word on this? Um, the last thing I give up and, and I hope they never take it from me, is my capacity to laugh and, and make fun of the system. And as long as I have that, I think I have at least the basis for a future democracy that I'll need. Uh, thanks. I'll just reiterate that um, I think we need to uh, pay particular attention to fair dealing. Um, after all, if uh, we want to continue to be able to laugh, it will afford us new provisions for parody and satire. So, um, but in, in all seriousness, I, I think that as educators looking at dramatic changes to copyright, uh, fair dealing is one particular and concrete part of uh, the law, technology, education equation that, uh, that really demands our, our very focused attention uh, to be able to um, continue to uh, function in open and closed environments and to continue uh, the fight against overly draconian copyright legislation. Thanks for inviting me to join us. All right, well, thanks all. If I could ask audience members here, if you go up to the uh, icon just above our names that looks like a smiley face right now, but if you drop down, uh, click on that drop down, you get the applause option. So if I could just ask you to join me in uh, uh, thanking our uh, presenters for a terrific session, some great comments, and certainly a conversation that needs to be ongoing uh, down the road.